Not only do we have this beautiful, beautiful heavenly family and heavenly home, but we have a family of God. We have brothers and sisters, not only at this church, but all over the world. We praise you for that. We give you glory for that. We're so grateful for that, that you thought of us, that you would even bother to go out of your way to stand outside of the door of our lives and knock on that. Sure, you could barge your way in, God. You could do that. But you're loving and you're kind and you've given us free will. You've given us the ability to say yes to you and to open up to you. And we have an enemy who loves to keep that door closed. And so we come against the enemy who does not want us to know you, who does not want us to experience your love, who does not want us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, who wants us to suffer and be lonely and depressed and anxious. So for people all around in the sphere of influence of Sharon Church, those who are online, I pray this morning that even as I am praying, hearts would be open, minds would be open, lives would be open for transformation. We say we are a praying church, loving people to Christ. Let, Lord, it's then up to them whether they want to do anything with that or not. And it's up to us to help them in their relationship with Jesus to grow. So give us strong leaders who can show us how to teach and to train people up in the ways of the Lord. To train people in the ways of your word, the actions that you modeled in Jesus Christ in the early church. The way people undoubtedly sought after and built your kingdom here at Sharon in this community. We stand on their legacy. We ask you that we would be able to build on top of that with confidence. And we know that that's your will. We know that your kingdom is being built with or without us. But you want it to be with us. <laughs> Father, we do have this list, the written list and the, the read out loud list and the, the list that we carry individually in our hearts and in our minds of people and situations that, that just call out for your attention. And we know that you're a God who hears the cries of your children and responds. You are gracious. You are compassionate. You are kind. You're a healer. You restore broken things back to the way you created them. You, you take broken lives and put them back together can do that with marriages and bank accounts and credit scores. We call on the full, full measure of everything that you have for us today, knowing that you're, you're eager to give, you're eager to heal, you're eager to bless as we trust you more and more. And Lord, we don't love you because you bless us. We love you simply because you're our God. And you've stamped your image in us. Help us to be more like you. So indeed, Lord, we pray, we plead that you would heal the sick, that you would comfort those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, that you would come around people in war-torn parts of the world, places in the world where people are starving and have been for decades wherever people don't know Jesus Christ, Lord. Make your glory known. There's nothing impossible for you. So we pray for miracles in this world. For those who are anxious and those who've sent their sons and daughters into military service and are wondering what, what's next for them, we pray your comfort and your confidence.
today in this daylight savings time uh, week, we, we thank you for the opportunity of what will look like brighter days. Help us to walk in them, not just physically, but spiritually. To be people who love to walk in your light. And may we take the light with us, the light of your love, of your grace, as your, and of your mercy. And now, together, we lift up the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. This time I invite the ushers to come forward as we prepare to give and receive our tithes and offerings. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Lord, we gratefully dedicate these tithes and offerings to your use through the ministry of Sharon United Methodist Church. You have called us to this. Help us to be faithful and good stewards. In your name, amen. Let's join together in saying what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Be sad to see. Good morning. Today's reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, 
then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This is the word of God for the people of God. That's a pretty good deal from God, don't you think? I'll give you a choice. You can have life, and we, we now know that we're talking about eternal life, like life forever in the presence of our Creator. <laughs> or you can choose death, which is eternal death and separation from God and all the good things that God has to offer. It seems like that would be a good choice and an easy choice to make. Choose life. And yet human history has continued to say, to uh, show that we really have a hard time with that. We like to play around with the darkness. We like to play around with death. We really do. It's, it's just that fallen nature that we have. It's not anything that we asked for. It, we really, we didn't do it on purpose, but we have that inside of us. That's part of our faith. And that's why we need a savior, right? To, to replace all of our infatuation with death and darkness with life and light and love. That's what the gospel really is. And that Jesus Christ has made that available to us. Jesus absorbed death in his own body and then rose from the dead to clear the way for us to make a really easy choice. I choose life. I choose life. And still, there are people that have never heard that. Nobody has ever told them that they do not have to dwell in darkness because people that are supposed to be doing that aren't doing it and even after we've told people we aren't necessarily well equipped to help them grow in that you have to learn how to live we, we come into this new life as babies right babies and, and we need spiritual milk first and then kind of some soft food, and eventually we can start chewing on some, some real hard stuff or some solid meat. Well, hopefully it's not solid meat. You know what I mean. And so we're working through a series about discipleship, about creating a culture of disciples who know how to live the way of Jesus, but also who know how to invite other people into the life of disciples of Jesus Christ and to teach them and to train them to the point where they can make disciples. We really have lost that in the church to a large extent. We have lost the ability to evangelize and to tell people the very simple good news and then to help them to grow in that if they receive that. And so I'm I'm at least planting some seeds, and I hope that our church family will grab a hold of that and it will take some life and we'll see some very intentional opportunities for us to be trained in discipleship. And if that sounds kind of uh, hard, 
or something like, what's, what's the church have to do with training? I would tell you that that's all Jesus was doing with his disciples was training them. That's what a discipler is, somebody who trains. And so if you think that's inappropriate, then you think Jesus' method of making disciples is inappropriate. <laughs> we talked about that triangle the first week, about how important it is for disciples to have a three-dimensional experience with God, that upward dimension of being plugged into this higher power, the Lord, through prayer and through worship and Bible study and during this time of Lent that we're in, maybe some fast too. That upward dimension is so important for us to plug into. Jesus exemplified that as he would get away into a private place just to pray. We also have that inward dimension of discipleship where we learn to love each other. We have Christian community. We share meals together. We share tasks together. We, we're in ministry with one another. We, we do fun things together and we work together. That's the inward dimension of discipleship. And then the outward, moving out to our spheres of influence, moving intentionally out, making new friends, making new relationships so that we might have the opportunity to bring somebody to Christ and to help them grow that relationship. Today, I really want to talk about that part, about how to think about invitation in the church, but also how to upgrade that with the challenge of being part of the church, you know? And so this is, this is the topic today. In our gospel reading, you will see that Jesus gets 70 people 70 disciples and gives them a challenge. And so we finally got to the gospel reading. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Now he had just done a lot of teaching and preaching, and that's what's going on here. He's healed some people. He's driven out some demons. And so Jesus has been with his disciples doing all those things. And then it says, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whenever you, whatever house you enter, <laughs> excuse me, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet know this. Well, I guess I've gone a little further than that. But I'm going to finish this sentence. The kingdom of God has come near. I tell you on that day it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. And this is our gospel reading for us today. <laughs> Probably at least in the near future, Sharon Church isn't going to be sending you out as missionaries. Probably. It's possible. There's a lot of churches that do that. They raise people up out of the congregation. Some of them, they raise some pastors, but they also raise up missionaries. I don't know if there's ever been a missionary that has come out of Sharon United Methodist Church. 
That would be pretty cool. It would be quite appropriate for missionaries to be raised up. But for most of us, we're talking about how to live out this kind of outreach within the lives that we live, in the places where we live, with the people that we come into contact with. And so think about your sphere of influence. Think about the orbit that you operate in and really apply this principle to that. You will come across people who don't know Jesus. You'll come across people who used to know Jesus and left Jesus behind. You'll come across all kinds of different things. Jesus was saying to his disciples, I'm sending you out like sheep, docile, kind, to deal with the wolves. So there's a warning with this, too. As we go out trying to build new relationships with people, hoping to build the kingdom of God, don't be surprised if there's some wolves, if there's some resistance, if not everybody says, yeah, I want to know your God. I want to be saved. Baptize me right now. That might not happen. But then again, it might. What if it did? And that person showed up on Sunday morning filled with new, fresh faith. Would that excite anybody? That would excite Susie and me. I know that for sure. When's the last time that happened? It's really important that we talk about these things. We've got to put a vision out there of what's possible. We've got to put a vision out there of what Jesus wants. Otherwise, well, our best mission field is trying to get people from other churches to come here. That is the lousiest plan for growing the church I've ever heard of, and it's the most common plan. Please don't think about outreach in terms of stealing other people's sheep. There's other sheep out there that have not heard. Jesus has said that, right, in the scriptures. There's others that are, they're out there. They're mine. You go get them. Jesus was the master of offering invitations to relationship. And Jesus was also the master, once people came into a relationship, of challenging them right off the bat. (laughs) Imagine people that had been with Jesus, learning from him, watching him, maybe hero-worshiping him a little bit. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, I'm sending you out now. You get to go in pairs. Don't take anything with you. And now you do the things you've seen me doing. All right. (laughs) Oh, and by the way, some of them won't like you, but some of them will. That's what I want to talk about today. There are people that are ready because the Holy Spirit's been working on them to come into a relationship with you that leads to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that get you excited? Wesley would call that prevenient grace. The Holy Spirit's gone out and has stirred the hearts of people. And when we, we, filled with the Spirit, come into contact with them, and they're ready, they're an easy yes. And Jesus was sending his, out, his people out looking for the ones who were an easy yes. They were people of peace. There were other people that didn't want anything to do with their mission. And basically, Jesus says, try, try with them. But if they're not open to you, you go somewhere else. Kind of give it to them a little bit on the way out. I don't want even the dust of of your sidewalk to be on my shoes. That's pretty harsh. But the real message here is, Where are the people of peace that God has prepared to be open to you as a person, to you as a couple, to us as a church? That's where we need to be focusing our attention and not worrying about the people who aren't ready. They're not ready for us. It's not our fault. It's not even their fault. They're just not ready for us. Jesus could calibrate that. He was really good at it. 
there are people out there that would love to join up with a church like this if they even knew how. We can help them. We can help them join up. There's a, there's a metaphor in the horse world. I am not a horse expert, uh, but there is lots of evidence about how horses are herd animals, right? So some of you know horses real well. They're herd animals. They're not supposed to be by themselves. They have to be in a herd. They have to be in a pack of horses for protection, for fun, for romance. They can't be out there by themselves. They can't survive very long outside. And so out in the wild, there's this, there's this dynamic where a herd will be led by a lead stallion or whatever, and there's always a lead mare, too, who kind of has the power to welcome people in, or horses, or to make sure they stay out. And there's this thing called join up, which is so interesting, and what will happen is, let's just say the herd is behind me, and I'm the lead mare, and there's somebody out there. Let's say it's Karen. Say, raise your hand, Karen. And Karen really wants to be part of the herd. She's lonely. She needs people in her life. She needs other horses. <laughs> and so she starts coming around and sniffing around and hanging around outside. And the lead mare, there's this, there's this thing called join up where the lead mare will go out just a little bit and turn her side show her flank, which is a sign of vulnerability that basically says, you can come in a little. And so if that, if that horse starts coming in a little bit, here's the, the challenge part. The lead mare will square up and look her right in the eye, which is the dance of authority, which backs her off a little bit. So just so that, sh so that she knows I am the boss. But then, more vulnerability, showing the flank again, showing the side, welcoming to come in. Eventually, over time, with this kind of a dance that goes on, there's, there's almost, I'm, my wife is right there, so I can get away with this. Would you come up here just a bit? Eventually, we get to reenact that. Eventually, there's, a, 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 yeah. Eventually, there's a join up, there's a trusting, there's an actual physical touching, probably some smelling, and talk about the, their, their mouths get moist and they start licking their chops, and they're ready for the lead mare to bring in the new member of the herd is joining up. Without the challenge part, it's no good because there is a natural pecking order within that herd and the new member needs to understand how things work in the herd. And that's even true in a church family. There's a certain way we do things. There's a certain way we don't do things. So just want you to know on the way in. And what church talks like this? Most church talks like, let's do anything to attract people to come. Well, no matter what they do, we're good with it because we just want them to come. We're desperate for new people. But Jesus would have us say, we, of course we want you to come. But if you're going to be part of us, you, there's certain things you can't do, and there's th certain things you, you have to do. Yeah, it's a give and a take. It's invitation and it's challenge. Jesus is famous for saying, follow me, right? Come be my disciple. Jesus is also famous for saying to those same people, if anybody's going to follow after me and be my disciple, they have to deny themselves every day, pick up their cross, and follow me. Is that invitation a challenge? I think so. He was unapologetic about the challenge part because he knew that that's how people would really understand that being included came at some price. You know, I remember just 
When I wanted to be on the football team when I was younger, when the coaches weren't looking, the older guys would just beat the snot out of us younger guys. It was a rite of passage. I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying that anybody should ever do that, but it was something that happened. And if we could survive that, we became part of the team. I, I hope that never happens again, happens again. Gangs. You can't just join a street gang, I guess, without being beaten up and bloodied. There's something about this. For us, it's more like you take a pledge on the way into the church where you say, I, I promise, I, I believe in Jesus, and I will support the ministries of the church, and I'll be here. I will put some money in the offering. I will volunteer when something needs to be done. That's the challenge we get. That's not so bad, is it? <laughs> That's not so bad. But if we don't offer that challenge, then What's the use of anybody ever joining? Where's the commitment? All right. I'm going to have you put up the, the invitation and challenge matrix, Connie. It's another little picture. I hope you can sort of see it. This is another tool developed by Mike Breen, the pastor that did a lot of work uh, in discipleship. Susie and I sat at his feet, and so we learned from him. But this invitation and challenge matrix, this is high invitation and low invitation, high challenge and low challenge. The church we want that's healthy and growing is this discipleship quadrant, the empowering culture, where there's a high level of invitation, but there's also a high level of challenge. We want people to come, and we, we want to make it fun. We want to make it inviting. Look at this beautiful building, and, and look at, look at, listen to this beautiful praise team. It's an invitational, high invitational thing. We, we welcome you at the door. We, offer services, high invitation. And then challenge. That's why we have all those items in the bulletin. What will you do? How will you plug in? How will you participate? Right? If we have low invitation, like we don't even make it easy or welcoming for people, but we challenge them if they do come, that's just discouraging and stressful. We don't want to be that church, do we? Come here because we're desperate for help. We're going down. And so we'll take anybody, but we're not healthy enough to make it interesting or fun or loving for you. That's just awful. Do you know people join churches like that anyway? Because they're that desperate. They're that desperate. I feel bad about that. If it's low invitation... And also, very little challenge. That's just boring. People are apathetic. Who cares? We'll stay in the church until the church doors close. Whatever. Nobody asks us to do anything. We never do anything. We're just showing up because this is what we do. Uh, we don't want to be that church, do we? No. And then there's this one. High invitation. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. You don't have to do anything unless you want to. Well, that's a cozy, consumeristic church culture. That is the American church problem today. All invitation and no daring to challenge people. And that can go pretty far, but what ends up happening is the church has to hire an enormous staff to do all the work. And then we have to find money to pay the enormous staff to do all the work, but that work is really for the laity. And so these mega churches have mega buildings and mega staffs and mega expenses. And so they have to just keep inviting people with lots of bells and whistles. 
Don't get me wrong. I'd love for this church to blow up into a mega church, to make a mega impact for the kingdom of God. But I would want this church to blow up into a mega church because of a, the power of the laity. So that I could just cheer you on and invitation and challenge, looking for people of peace. There are people out there. There are people out there looking, looking to join in. And this new generation, the youngest folks, if they even had a little bit of encouragement, invitation, and then people meeting them to come alongside of them and challenge. A challenge might just look like, come and eat with me on Wednesday. That's a challenge and an invitation. Come and sit with me and worship. Pray with me. Pray with me is an invitation and a challenge, isn't it? You know, I've told somebody else this this week. In 20-some years, I've only ever had one person say no when I asked if I could pray with them. People want to be included in what's, what God is doing. They want to be prayed for. They want to belong. We'll just offer Let's stop worrying about the people who don't seem to be people of peace. We can leave them for other people to reach. And God will use other people to reach those people in time. We pray. Let's find those people who are ready to go. The people who are kind of hanging out on the fringes of your life, sniffing around, seeing if you'll let them in. It starts with an invitation to you. I think, before an invitation to the church. Sometimes it can work the other way. But God is doing that work. He's planting the seeds. He's preparing people. Will we show our vulnerability? But will we also dare to say, if you want to be part of us, this is how we are, and this is what we do. Bring something. Teach us, too. You teach us what you know. We'll teach you what we know most important thing that we know is that God loves us so much. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him will never die but have everlasting life. That's worth sharing. That's worth living into. So have fun with that. I'd be happy to speak with anybody about these things. Uh, it, it takes some practice, but it does work. I usually work out people at the gym because that's the only other place I really go on a regular basis. And I meet people at the gym. And some of them are people of peace. And I get to know them. And some of them have been here. That young guy that was here, I won't say his name. It was, all, it was exciting. He wanted to be baptized. and everything. He got so excited about his faith that he found another church that had more kids his own age. And he's thriving there. I think that's pretty good. I wish he'd stayed here. <laughs> but but that's, what a joy. <laughs> what a joy. And then there's other people that they don't even want to look at me when I say good morning. I, I'll say good morning to them five or six times and after, eventually I'll just, whatever. Do your thing. Do your thing. Chuck, man, I'm glad. You sniffed around for like one week, and then all of a sudden you're like, what, what, how can I plug in? And little by little, y'all have welcomed Chuck into the church family. You're still sitting way over there, but I guess that's so you can be closer to the drums. I'm singling you out because I know you well enough to know that you're okay with us talking about it. This is beautiful. Chuck has new family that he never had before, and we have a new brother. Some of us, it's like a son or a grandson. And I think it's beautiful. I want to see that more and more and more and more and more and more. If we're making disciples, then we're looking for what God is doing. 
And we're leaning into that. And God is calling people. Let's pray. Lord, it's exciting to think about how your kingdom grows and how you have called us and trained us to be on the lookout for people of peace. We want so much to make a difference for you, for your glory. We want to see more people open up the doors of their hearts to receive you in. We love you for loving us. We pray your blessing over our church family as we bless you and as we bless our neighbors. Help us to not miss any opportunity to invite people into our world. And you are our world. And I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please stand. You take what is And you make it beautiful When love floods in We're restored forevermore With breath that brings the dead to life with words that pierce the dark with light only by the blood are we set free with mercy strong to carry shame and nailed it to a tree you alone hold the power to redeem no guilt come peace within us since crucified no grave can hold what your grace has justified with breath that brings the dead to life with words that pierce the dark with light only by the blood are we set free with mercy strong to carry shame and nail it to a tree you alone hold the power to redeem rejoice so oh child of god Lift your eyes to see With every morning light Again we are redeemed Rejoice, O oh child of God Lift your eyes to see with every morning light again we are redeemed with breath that brings the dead to life with words that pierce the dark with light only by the blood are we set free with mercy strong to carry shame and nail it to a tree you alone hold the power to redeem oh you alone hold the power to redeem oh you alone hold the power to redeem beautiful go now with joy in your hearts and confidence that you you have something that people need in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen
Dennis. I think so. Good job.